TED is about ideas, ideas that are worth spreading. And today I want to talk about theories. Now, we've all had ideas. We've all got our own pet theories, and usually it's pretty obvious to us, to us which ones are good and which ones are not so good. However, some ideas that might initially seem good uh, may later turn out to be anything but. For example, that extra pint of beer or glass of wine seemed like a good idea at the time. Filling a 200,000 meter cubed transatlantic zeppelin with highly flammable hydrogen gas <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time. Basing most of our economy on the financial services industry seemed like a good idea at the time. Some ideas aren't good. In fact, some ideas are downright terrible. So what do we do? Well, I want to talk about theories today. Ideas relating to how we think about and interpret the world around us. And in that sense, we have good, good theories too, and we also have bad theories. The good theories help us go beyond the limits of our current understanding of the world, whereas the bad theories don't help us at all. We want to get rid of those, those ideas. We want to kill them. Now, to start off, I'm going to go through some notable ideas, like theories, from history. So in 360 BC, you had Plato, the philosopher, and his book Timaeus, in which he put forward a theory of everything, an idea about how to interpret the natural world. And he said that everything was made up of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And further to that, he said that each of these elements was made up of a uh, platonic solid, the friendly shapes. Um, so fire, for example, was made of pointy tetrahedrons, which is why when you touched it, it hurt, it burned, and earth was made up of cubes, which is why it stacks up so nicely. Now, of course, this seems pretty ridiculous to us now, but at around the same time, Democritus of Thrace struck upon another theory of everything. He struck upon the atomic theory, the idea that matter is made up of indivisible units that can't be destroyed, atoms. Now, this seems a lot more familiar to us. However, it wasn't until the 19th century that experimental evidence confirmed the atomic hypothesis. And this gives us our first clue as to how we go about killing theories, experimental evidence. Now, another theory uh, relates to how we think about light. In the, again, in the 19th century, scientists knew that light traveled as a wave, but that it could also travel through a vacuum. It didn't need anything to carry the light vibrations. Now, this confused scientists so much that they proposed an entirely new material, the luminiferous ether. Now, this stuff was pretty strange. You couldn't see it, you couldn't feel it if you moved slowly enough, yet it was strong enough for the high frequency vibrations of light to transmit. It was sort of like an all permeating, invisible super custard. But the problem was there was no evidence for it. Experiments by Michelson and Morley in 1887 tried to measure the speed of the Earth through the super custard by measuring the speed of light. But what they found was that the speed of light didn't change no matter how they measured it. Now, this pretty much killed the ether theory, but only because Einstein's theory of special relativity, which took as a fundamental tenet that the speed of light was a constant, replaced the theory of ether, helping to kill it. And it turns out that Einstein's theory is a much better way of thinking about space, time, light, and matter. Now, finally, I want to talk about quantum theory quickly. Now, this is a completely crazy theory which describes how we think about matter at the very smallest levels. It says that light, oh, sorry, it says that matter can behave as either a wave or a particle, depending how you look at it. Now, you can interpret this in two ways. You can either say that the universe explores every single possibility, and we only see the average of that, or you can say that at every decision at the microscopic level, a new universe pops into existence. And this is the multiverse interpretation of quantum theory. Now, both of these sound completely ridiculous, almost as crazy as the platonic shapes thing. But experimental evidence backs up quantum theory at every single level. In fact, it gives us our most accurate and precise predictions. We cannot kill quantum theory. And again, it's down to experimental evidence. So to sum up, Plato's theory of the elements, dead. Democritus's at, uh, atomic theory, still alive. Luminiferous ether, dead. Killed by the null results and the fact that it was a better theory to replace it. 
quantum theory, I'd love to say it's both dead and alive. Ha ha ha. Um, but uh, no, it's still very much alive. And it's down to this idea of testing our theories with experimental evidence. So what's our current best theory of everything? Well, it's a combination of quantum theory and special relativity. And it's summed up by something called the standard model of particle physics. And I haven't got time to go into the full detail, but basically it describes matter, the stuff we're all made of, and forces, the stuff that pushes things together and pulls them apart. And here it is, the standard model of particle physics. On the right here, sorry, your left, you have fermions, the matter particles. And they interact with each other and themselves, not like that, by passing bosons, uh, force particles, and they exchange those. And this describes how we think matter works at the fundamental level. Now, this thing has withstood every single experimental test that we've thrown at it, so it's still alive, bar one. And that's this thing in the top right-hand corner here, the Higgs boson. I don't know, you, you may have heard something about that in the media. It likes to keep a fairly low profile. <laughs> but it is the last piece of the standard model puzzle that we haven't got experimental evidence for yet. We've had hints, but there aren't firm confirmations. And if we didn't find it, this would be the thing that finally killed the standard model as a theory. And that, some people would say, that would be the best possible result. Now, so that's all very well. We've got our theory of the standard model. We've got our general concept of testing theories with experimental evidence. But it's not always that simple. And to demonstrate, I want to talk about a theory which is close to my heart. I want to talk about supersymmetry. Now, supersymmetry is an extension of the standard model, where basically every particle that we know and love in the standard model has a super partner, a super particle, or a sparticle, as we call it. I'm Spartacle, yeah, uh, you can, it's not that good a joke. Anyway, so we have these sort of strange shadow particles um, that exist. And basically what we do is we take every particle in the standard model and, and add a super particle. So we have fermions that have force particles, super bosons, and every boson, every force particle has a super matter particle or a uh, super boson, super fermion. So, now, this doubling of particle numbers, surely that's not particularly helpful. It's uh, not particularly elegant and not very good. Well, actually, supersymmetry helps solve a lot of problems. For example, these particles have to have, be very massive and also uh, interact very weakly. And so they're basically invisible. So they provide a candidate for this dark matter stuff, this missing fifth of the universe. That's another story. Don't worry about that. But the best thing, the best thing about supersymmetry is that it fundamentally links the matter and the forces. Two things that we thought were fundamentally different components of reality are suddenly two sides of the same existential coin. And that's why supersymmetry is so alluring and why I spent four years looking for it with my PhD. Now, so how do you find evidence for supersymmetry? This is what my talk is based on after all. Well, if these particles are massive, we need a lot of energy by E equals mg squared, the energy mass equivalence of Einstein. To make a lot of energy, we need a large particle accelerator. We need a large hadron collider. And here it is. This is an aerial view of Geneva. I've um, superimposed the ring. That's, it's not really there. Um, but uh, so here's a better view of it in, in cartoon form. And you can see that this 27 kilometer long tunnel under the Swiss Franco border, we take protons, accelerate them around at 99.99999% of the speed of light, and smash them together at four points around the ring. Two of which are the uh, Atlas and CMS detectors. These are like cathedral sized digital cameras that take photos of the proton collisions. So how do we look for supersymmetry? Well, as you may have spotted, um, it's quite, diff quite difficult because they interact weakly. They're, only, they're sort of invisible, so you can't really see them with these digital cameras. So what we have to do is design these things very carefully. Here's a picture of the CMS detector magnet system. Yeah, I can hear you gasping. Yeah, science doesn't get any bigger than this. <laughs> There are a few people, uh, you can see them there. Um, here's a sort of slightly idealized uh, cartoon view. Um, and you have all these different components of the detector that measure everything that comes out. You add up everything, and by the conservation of momentum, anything that's disappearing, like sparticles, uh, you can infer by the fact that you haven't measured it. So 
we did all this. We gathered all of our data. We analyzed it. We looked for what's missing. And if anything, if more stuff is missing than you think, uh, then your predictions without supersymmetry tell you, then you've got a hint that you may be producing sparticles at the LHC. So what did we find? That's the $5 billion question, isn't it? And um, as it turns out, uh, nothing. <laughs> not a supersymmetric sausage. Um, or at least I should say, not yet. And th the same is true of uh, Atlas as well. They haven't found anything either. So is supersymmetry dead? Have we killed the theory? Well, it's not quite that simple. In particle physics, we're very lucky. We get to do our experiments again and again by colliding protons and lots and lots. But in other fields, such as cosmology, we only get one universe to play with. With climate change, for example, we only get one planet to play with, or screw up, depending on, on how you look at it. And uh, with evolution, only one form of intelligent life has evolved. And they're happily splashing around in the sea. <laughs> while we watch TED Talks on YouTube. Now, the point is, is that this idea of testing every single theory again and again isn't always valid. Sometimes there are some things that we just can't do like that, that we have to apply a slightly different way of thinking about, that we can still think about scientifically. So if we can't kill supersymmetry like that, perhaps the approach of the luminous ether should apply. Maybe we just haven't found a way of, so we've got this null result, but we need a better theory to replace supersymmetry. Well, that's difficult as well, because supersymmetry is so well established, along with the standard model, that coming up against that is actually very difficult. And as the philosopher Thomas Kuhn put it in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, sometimes you do need a revolution to completely rethink uh, your ideas in physics. And null results, like we've had with supersymmetry so far, or the luminiferous ether, can help like that. But you can talk about philosophy, you can talk about science, you can talk about this experimental evidence thing, but what really matters when it comes to exploring our theories, our ideas, and our beliefs is the time and energy that we expend. I spent four years on this PhD looking for supersymmetry, and we didn't find it. So I've made the decision now to move away from looking for supersymmetry, from spending my time, my energy, my life looking for it. I'm now actually looking at the upgrade, how we deal with higher energies, more particle collisions at the, for the next generation of experiments that will probe our theories of physics. And that's the point I wanted to make with this talk, really. You can have ideas, you can have theories, and you should discuss them, and you should, because it's enormous fun, and you should investigate them. But what really matters when determining how you kill a theory is how many people are spending time on those beliefs, spending time investigating those theories. And who knows, with supersymmetry, people are still looking, and they should do, but the number of people uh, looking may well decrease. So, to conclude, how do you kill a theory? Well, you try and find evidence that disproves it, that rules it out. Now, if you can't do that, then you try and find a better theory. A theory that does a better job of describing the world around us and explaining how things work. And if you can't do that, well, you probably can't kill that particular theory. Some theories will only die when the last person stops believing. Thank you very much. Thank you.